Hi guys, welcome back to My Steps to Sobriety, my show on YouTube and as a podcast with me, your host, Stefan Neff. Today is another fantastic day for an interview. I've got Jeremy Sherman with me. I was looking really forward to this interview. The reason is that I'm a bit of a hothead. And every day there are people out there who absolutely drive me bonkers. Um, you can call them with many names, but I think today we stick with the name asshole um, because I think that's quite relevant and quite important. A, I use that language. B, my guest is using that language, uh, but not in order to trigger you guys. Oh my God, profanity. But no, in order to just describe that 10% of people make 90% of the work, uh, at least in my profession, but in many others as well. And Jeremy has become an expert in looking at difficult people, the, the people that often make us go, ah, and trigger all kinds of emotions. So today we look at those people, but we also look at why you respond like that. Why are they assholes to you? And someone else says, oh, no, he's just a cool dude. Um, so what's going on there? So lots of chaos, but a man who has got a torch to bring to light <laughs> some light into that chaos. <laughs> Jeremy, welcome to my show. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. And I have to clarify straight from the start, I'm not an expert. You cannot call yourself an expert. I don't think across psychology, but especially on psychoproctology, which is what I call this. Sub I'm a specialist. I'm not an expert. I don't think one can be an expert on this. And I have to clarify this. Um, the People who claim to be experts on diagnosing assholes tend to be very dangerous people. So um, that's, uh, I mean, when you think about it, uh, some of the worst people in human history considered themselves the absolute expert on who's an, who's, an, who's an asshole. And so the question that actually inspired this work originally 25 years ago for me is what is a butthead since it can't just be whoever I happen to butt heads with. Um, that is, I was looking for a more objective definition or diagnostic or way of distinguishing assholery. Um, and, uh, and I also considered that to be what I call a fruitful exercise in futility. I do not think we can come to an objective definition of asshole, but I think it's well worth trying. Hmm. Because as soon as you start trying, you actually try to actually find common grounds. And if you think about uh, communication skills and about uh, um, trying to deal with conflict, then this is the very first step. So it's interesting that you say that. So what triggered you to actually do that work? What, what, what was the I event? Was there one event or was there... Was no, there... there was and there wasn't. Um, uh, um, I happened to be trapped in a relationship, not a romantic relationship, um, a family relationship uh, with someone who was hard to diagnose. We couldn't tell whether he was handicapped or indulgent. And I was in, I should, I'll just be clear on this. It was uh, one of my three children and I had a responsibility to love him unconditionally and to accommodate him if he's handicapped. Mm. And at the same time, I had a responsibility to uh, make sure he didn't grow up to be an asshole. Um, and if he was indulgent, I had to push him. So this was actually what inspired a lot of my early work about 25 years ago um, was because I went off and got a PhD in decision theory, evolutionary decision theory as a result of dealing with this question. Is it indulgence or is it handicapped? The response is the appropriate response is uh, opposite. If he's handicapped, you you accommodate him. If he's indulgent, you push him. You can't do both at once. And there's a third option that became clear after a while, which is that he's neither. He uh, he's just a, of a different culture. In which case, I would mm, get to live and let live elsewhere. Is what would happen. Now this 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 son is now 41 years old. Um, uh, but the, but that was an early inspiration. At the same time, I, I have a master I have a master's degree in public policy from UC Berkeley. I had been uh, I had run an environmental organization for uh, years, a national lobbying organization. I had been you could say an activist, and I was increasingly aware that the problems we're dealing with are not technical. Um, they have to do with the wetware, the human mind. And I was, uh, there was a really juicy midlife crisis around, uh, around 40 years old where I started paying more attention to what's going on in the wetware than in the, you know, you could say the, 
oh, the social engineering realm. Um, so those were those were early inspirations, and then I happened to finally get around to writing this book during the uh, during the Trump era here. And so it was just beautiful. It was a, it, because, I mean, it's just exquisite time to be doing it. I, I could meditate on him. You know, you could mistake you could you could mistake Stalin for a communist. Um, uh, but it's hard to mistake. Hit, uh, you could mistake Hitler for a nat- nationalist, but it's really hard to mistake Trump for anything but an asshole in that he doesn't really even have much of a policy uh, cover. He doesn't really, it's a holy war, but there's there's absolutely nothing clear and focused that he's fighting for it other than himself. So mm-hmm. so that was a great time to be meditating on it. Uh, stuck inside during COVID, COVID um, trying to stay post-angst and post-outrage um, and treating psychoproctology as like criminology. That is, you're not hand-wringing or upset about the fact that there are assholes in the world. Obviously, there are. Um, and trying to get clearer on what's going on uh, in w- with us all. And this comes back to your point. That is, um, nothing human is foreign to me. So I'm trying to understand this distinction. I have all the same impulses that an asshole has. So what then is the difference? It's an interesting question to me. And I just wrote this book, What's Up With Assholes, um, on that topic. And how to stop them. It's not just diagnostics. Mm-hmm. It's also treatment and prevention. <laughs> and that's that's interesting, isn't it? It's beautiful. But, and, and we maybe have to... to delineate here a bit because yeah. ultimately from from for for all the viewers and listeners out there if if we if we doctors sort of think about assholes then we think about those people that are assholes and they they, they might not even know about it and and literally don't know about it and that for them there are there are people where different behavior different beliefs everything is hardwired and we call them personality disorders so you know about one in ten people have got a personality disorders and some of them can be extreme like a psychopath or a sociopath so one percent mm-hmm. of the population are falling into that group um, so there are people who are hardwired out there then there are other people who are not hardwired um, but they just have gone through so much crap in their life that their belief system has completely changed to a a very selfish and very focused and driven they go over corpses um because that is that is how they had survived very traumatic childhood etc but it still makes them an asshole so let's be quite clear so for us there is always sort of the question huh who are you and i love the way you tried to figure out with your son is that a handicap or is it just yeah hmm um, indulgent, yeah. indulgent. Oh, I love that indulgent. That's actually a word I have not used in that second setting. I might actually just, uh, yeah, I've got many reasons why I can use this such a <laughs> word as well. Uh, but it's interesting. So, so these are the thoughts that go through through doctors. Is that actually something that needs um, acceptance and the right psychiatric help, the right more interventional work kind of stuff, or is that actually you're just an asshole? Um, and it's interesting. Well, yeah, yeah, it is interesting. And and what I, so I've been dealing with the challenge of basically positing a broader category, a more inclusive category than the congenital or hardwired uh, diagnostics. Um, I think the field is suffering a bit from having um, these diagnostic terms that don't cover it all. So the, 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 the number of ex-partners who assume that their exes are narcissists when they wouldn't be necessarily clinically diagnosed as a narcissist um, uh, is, is telling. There's a category that is broader, and yet there are taboos against talking about asshole as a category. There are a few people who have broken through it. Um, uh, but I, what I also want to focus on is um, how how enticing it is to become an asshole. It's not. I do not think that you can diagnose them based on biography or etiology. I think that you can. Every path we're on has these easy detours to assholia. That is, and it, and there would be real advantages. You know, we say that crime doesn't pay. Mm. Crime pays beautifully mm. if you can get away with it. And assholery pays beautifully if you can get away with it. Playing God is way easier than being human. Hmm. And and so so 
I have to, I'm very focused on the motivated versions of this and um, less focused on the hardwired versions. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, th there's payoff for being, for acting psychopathic when you can get away with it. Um, some people do it part-time. Some people do it selectively with some people and not others. There are some full-time 360-degree, 24-7 assholes. Mm -hmm. um, they'll tend to be a little rarer. Um, I think that, that, but but I still have to think. I still think there is a a diagnostic, either for assholery or for being an asshole. And I think that it's about a kind of totality. I love the the original quote, which was, "Power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely." I think that what we're talking about is a kind of absoluteness that someone can adopt for themselves where they are impervious, uh, impervious, that is incorrigible in the literal sense. Nothing could correct them. They rule reality. Reality doesn't have any influence on them. It's a step away from sobriety. It's a step too far away from sobriety. If you think of soberness as being real, mm -hmm. being realistic, actually paying attention to reality, um, uh, and there's, there will be huge advantages uniquely available to humans. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of predators and parasites among animals, but being an asshole is a, is a human thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with language and a way that language enables us to escape. It's basically confirmation bias as a solution to all of your problems. That's what I end up thinking that assholery is. It's, uh, if it's, if it's, if it challenges me at all, it's fake or it proves I'm right. Um, if it agrees with me, it proves I'm right. You become self-winding. No matter how they shake you, you'll get wound up. Further affirmation that you're on the right path and everybody who disagrees with you is wrong. So that would be, and I, do, and I think of it not as narcissism, but as a robotic habit. If you find a habit, it's a lot like alcohol. Uh -huh. If you find a habit that enables you to feel better, reliably better, you will simply fall into it. So I think that treating narcissism as self-infatuation, they may be uh, infatuated with their appearance, but they are the least self-aware people of all. They are not looking at themselves. That's the whole point um, about it. So it's, I, I think it's a, a bit of a, a misnomer to describe it that way. And, mm. and the, the clinicians know this. They They know that uh, psychopaths, uh, that narcissists have weak ego structures. Um, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. There's no doubt about but, that. The interesting but, they, but it's not just compensatory. It's mm -hmm. also because when you become a narcissist or an asshole, being self-aware would only be a burden. Yeah, your your self-awareness would atrophy. You don't need it. And it would only get in the way. So, so it's a, it's a two-way street. Mm. You, it's, you're, you're being a narcissist to compensate for your weak ego structure. And you're also able to have a weak, you can afford a weak ego structure because you got something else that works better. <laughs> mm. So a lot of what I'm after is how to make being an asshole costly, which is different from trying to intervene and reason and reach out. It's a different approach. I think if we, if there are no consequences for being an asshole, why would anybody give it up? The same with mm. crime. You know, mm. if there's no consequences for crime, crime, why would you ever give it up? You know, it, if it's working for you. <laughs> so. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. Very, very good thoughts that you're bringing to the table there. For me, maybe too uh, many all at once, but I'm yeah, that's sorry, right, that's right. <laughs> I'm, it's beautiful, but I mean, I'll give you an example. At work, I I work with a number of surgeons in in my practice, uh, private practice, and on a Tuesday in one of the other theaters, there's one surgeon who is yeah, who would fit that diagnosis that we're talking about to the T. He is a man who roughs me up the wrong way. And, but he also, for example, one example is we, we work in scrubs, so our street gloves stay in the, in the cupboard, and we wear scrubs. Then when in the evening, when you undress, you put the scrubs into a big meter-by-meter meter washing bin kind of thing. Um, and guess what? <laughs> I know his size, what he wears. Uh, it's always on the ground about a meter, maybe two meters away from that bin. <laughs> that 
pisses me off because I try to treat the cleaner in the same way as I treat the CEO, uh, res respect, etc. So there is a man who on purpose gets something out of that. There must be a purpose behind that in on a very uh, below emotional scale even. How would you explain that behavior? Well, um, so this comes back to my argument that a butthead can't just be anyone I butt heads with. Huh. Um, uh, uh, it, so that is frustrating. That is annoying. Um, and, uh, and he could well be an asshole. I'm not, I'm not denying that, but I, I, I have to be really careful in this uh, work. Yeah. So one way to think about it is um, actually it relates to the title of uh, uh, um, your podcast, uh, Step to Sobriety. So I, I don't get to claim that, a, that an asshole disagrees with my versions of conscientiousness. That is, I, can't, I cannot define it on social grounds alone. I'm actually trying, it's got to be, I've got to be very careful about this. I think an asshole or asshole behavior is not addressing reality itself. That is pretending that you are bigger than reality, that you get to control our reality. I think that the number one rule for 3.8 billion years of life is adapt to reality or die. Yeah. Um, now, uh, what is reality? We will debate what reality contains, but I don't think we debate the container itself. The, it's the container of all the direct and indirect threats and opportunities we have to pay attention to or we die. That's what people mean when they're talking about something being real. So um, now here's a guy who is exercising a kind of uh, cap capriciousness or lordliness that is uh, that, that is pompous and all of that. He's playing God, you could say, in that moment. The world is here to serve him. Now, um, I want to, I'm very interested in asshole prevention, and I think we can only take steps towards sobriety, sobriety here being defined as being realistic. I don't think anyone could afford to be realistic all the time. I think that life is a shit show for humans. Um, we are an unusually anxious species. If you compare what we could worry about before falling asleep to what a dog could, It's just no contest. It's overwhelming the possibilities that humans can worry about all the threats and missed opportunities. Uh, and we are also a uniquely denialist or escapist creature. And I don't think that the, the answer, I think the answer is steps towards sobriety, but we do need ways to play God. We do. I need ways to play God or God's emissary. That is, I could, you know, where, where I think I have found the answer or the guy who's got the answer, the enlightened master. I do it through fiction. When I watch fiction, I'm playing God. Um, that is, I can imagine myself being like the superhero. I need a way to vent that appetite in myself. I need out outlets, outlets for it. And what I, so, so I'm interested in safe escapism or what I could call optimal illusion, how to kid yourself in ways that help and don't hinder. So the, so if this guy could only play video games in which he's marauding all around and killing all sorts of uh, underlings, all these non-player characters, it probably, it might be therapeutic. I'm saying, yes, we need that degree of self-love, but get a room, do it all, do it offline. I like, you know, I, I, like. I believe in masturbation. I think mm. we all need to masturbate. And I, that would include going to church and pretending that you're among the chosen. I mean, I, I think, I'm trying to demote the highfalutin versions of that to an elevated status for all of them. We need that kind of outlet. And it's best not done by tossing your, your scrubs uh, two meters from the bin. That's all. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that because obviously that behavior serves a need. Um, so yeah, that, we, uh, and a need we all have. Yeah, that's right. And it's interesting, as you say, there is there are some of us who maybe have been assholes in the past. I include myself there, where I showed my negative emotions in quite strong ways and probably let other people suffer. Uh, when I uh, was at the height of my, my addiction, height of my depression, or the low of my depression, should I say, um, it is, it's very easy. And that's why we, why we make amends. That's why we, we're <laughs> making amends. Step eight and nine in the 12 step system is such an important bit because we are yeah. experts in, in, we are wrecking balls for many relationships. So there's a lot of work to be done later. And therefore, for me, now being 
Eight years sober and eight years living a beautiful life where I strive every day to be better and not in this kind of weird pathological way better, just enjoying <laughs> life in, in, a, in, a, in a beautiful, beautiful way. Um, uh, practicing integrity, practicing um, to have a backbone to actually do the right things when no one is watching, those kind of things, uh, to then see other people maybe getting away with it or, or on purpose doing things. It just, you think, what? Um, but, so it is an interesting one because obviously the, the further polar we get, the further I move away from the asshole that I was, the more maybe the asshole behavior triggers me. And that's an interesting one. So Oh, yeah, no, yeah that's right. So I, 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 I happen to break out in a rash when I'm around... Um, New Age or leftist assholes. I, I remain primarily left-leaning, at least by the standards in the United States these days. But um, when I'm around someone who, for example, claims that love is the answer and defines love as uh, what they like, and uh, and if so, if you if you challenge them, so I break out in a rash in, in that because there was a time when I had that particular flavor of smugness about me. You can be an asshole for anything, as far as I'm concerned. That is, I I do know Buddhist assholes. I I know atheist assholes. I know Christian assholes. Uh, and you also can be a perfectly decent person for all these. From from my perspective, it's. The same bullshit, different branding, yeah. but but I but I noticed that my particular kind of branding, that the the kind that I was once drawn to and am now drawn away from, but but the other thing is, you said practicing integrity, and I want I want to just pick up on that. Integrity is not something one has. Um, in fact, by default, we are we do not have integrity. It's not like you're born with a coherent worldview that you continue to check up on. We are likely to talk out both sides of our mouths a fair amount. Humans have a will tend to be inconsistent. Inconsistency is the default. We could pretend that people are strictly logical and everything coheres, but no, of course that's not how it works. So I think of pra uh, practicing integrity as the alternative. Um, to being an asshole. You could mm. say an asshole has integrity, but only in one respect. And it's mm. the respect in which supposedly God has um, integrity. Uh, God is considered omnificent, omnipotent, and omniscient. But the fourth trait that's interesting about him is that he's one. So if you ask a theologian, can God build a mountain? So can he create a mountain so big he can't move it? If so, if not, or if so, he's not completely powerful. So they will say, no, he cannot do that because he has perfect integrity. So I think assholes have the, <laughs> they have a way of claiming perfect integrity while having none. Um, now me, I'm an ironist. So, which means that, um, which means, so I, I lay my, uh, double standards on the table. I tease at them. I joke at them. Hmm. One of my mottos is no matter how hard I chase the truth, it will never catch me. Um, so, so I, I, I want to show my ambivalence. I want to show my inconsistencies. I think it's humanizing. Yeah. Um, uh, it, and, and, and it's not, the, it's not the same as claiming, Hey, everybody's, everybody's got integrity problems. So what the fuck I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Not at all. That's mm -hmm. the cynical thing. And nor is it claiming that I'm a champion of integrity. Like I know what it is and I've got it. And anybody who disagrees with it. So this, I see irony. Mm -hmm. And in particular, what we, what, the, 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 there's a term I love from philosophy, fallibilism. Uh, my motto for fallibilism is no matter how confident I am in a bet, I remain still more confident that it is a bet. It's a recognition that we're all guessing. We're all betting. We cannot know for anything for certain. Sure. There's That's built right into irony. So, so all of that relates, and it also relates, sorry, to one last thing, which is um, you regret some of those, uh, so, uh, some of your brashness that hurt other people. Um, and... I regret the same in my life, but but I do think of the heart of irony is the serenity prayer. Hmm. Um, that is, we're trying, and I think of it as a prayer. The, I think the wisdom is praying for the wisdom to know, if for, for knowledge to know the differences that make a difference, for when to be assertive and when to not be assertive. So my best peace of mind, hmm. the, what I count as equanimity is when I'm equally worried 
that I am being too assertive or not assertive enough <laughs> for the situation. That's my, I'm not looking to notch into the perfect place. I'm on a lifelong quest for more wisdom to guess when to be assertive and when to not be. Ooh, nice, nice, <laughs> nice. And that's true across the spectrum. I've written probably 40 different variations on the serenity prayer that each address different tough judgment calls that life is going to be dealing with throughout. Notice that the thing about handicapped and lazy, handicapped and indulgence, is the serenity prayer itself. That is, do I have the courage to try to change my son's behavior or the serenity to accept it? That's the serenity prayer itself. So my entire life is spent in this fallibilist, ironist state where I'm trying, if someone says you're, you're too assertive and I said, yeah, I could be, or I could be not assertive enough. And I'm trying to figure out when to be which and, and how to, how to adjust the dial for the circumstance. I'm not over assertiveness. I, I I think it needs. I think we need it. For example, I think we need to give assholes a really hard time. So, <laughs> uh, very very true. But what strikes me with you, you are actually not just responding. You're our our uh, immediate. Uh, gut feeling is actually to respond to assholes, to be angry and fly off the handle, or be insulted, offended, um, and withdraw and think, oh, how how dare he? How does he? And, and etc. And yeah. so it is. It is. I find it often as telling how much someone rubs me up uh, the wrong way, as to actually try to figure out well why. What is really going on here? And sometimes I have to really be careful because sometimes I am hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Sometimes I am just at the brink of explosion and it doesn't, it doesn't need anything. It just needs someone to, to say something. Uh, you know, you come home, your wife says, honey, how are you? Arr! And it's, yeah. it's, it's uh, you know, she didn't say anything. Or she might have said it in, in, in a just a funky way. And I wanted to misunderstand it because my body is. Arr. Yeah. So I need to distinguish, am I the asshole here? Or is actually, is, is the other person the asshole? And I think that is sometimes work that so many of us actually don't do. Many of us are, are emotionally yeah. uh, non-existent, retarded. I, I, I know the word is, is, is no longer acceptable, but I'm still uh, struggling to find a better word to actually describe my own state in the past. Um, I had the, the emotional intelligence of a, of a one-day fly for crying out loud. Um, so therefore, um, it, is, it is the distinction. Is it me or is it them? What do you have for right, people yeah. who who haven't even started to work to explore where their own emotions are coming from? Right. Yes. So uh, there's a lot of wonderful stuff in there. Um, uh, um, and I love, and for me, so I, I consider myself intellectually bi-curious. Whenever I hear opposites, I find it interesting. Um, so there was a piece in there about um, uh, that, that, ties into something that we often hear these days, at least in California, which is if you have a problem with someone, it's about you, not them. Uh, and, and I don't, I, I think I agree with that wholeheartedly. That is, I think it's, it's sometimes the case. And my assumption is that if you don't want to be an asshole, you should expect some anxiety. And the anxiety that interests me around the question you're talking about, I call it the Yumius question. If there's a conflict between you and me, Is it you or me or us? And um, my rule with myself is the Yumius question. Is it, um, my goal is to get to the Yumius question within five minutes, maybe. Uh -huh. uh, that is, um, I'll, I'm likely to lash out. I'm a testosterone boy, you know? And, and I, not only that, I got a loud mouth and I've spent years cultivating a sharp tongue. Um, and I can do what I can to, uh, to train my intuition. But um, at least the rule for me is that within five minutes, I have to get around to that question, um, uh, the Yumias question. Now, back to the, and this, this harkens back to something that at the beginning of this, um, I think willpower is a weenie. I don't think that willpower to override my intuitions uh, is very likely to be strong. Um, 
So I'm more in the business. I have a saying, I can't change myself, but I can usually change my circumstances so they change me. Um, nice. there's, that's part of the story. But the other thing is that I've been, I've, been, I've had the luxury of having free time on in which to spend, uh, to devote myself to training my gut so I don't have to override it so much. Now, I happen to have a gut that is relatively trainable because of my cer lucky circumstances. I just, I didn't end up with, the, I, I, I have a feeling that I can, I can cultivate it slowly. That is, I think of my gut as my intuitive responses to things. Um but there are limitations to it, hence the five minute rule. And I and, and if I'm with someone else, I'll allow them, you know, two days, three days before they get to the Yumius question. You know, they can because it's because, it, you know, not everybody's had my circumstances. I had 2000 hours of Freudian psychoanalysis starting at the age of eight. I've spent a, a weird life in the luxury of and the horrors of, of introspection. I mean, you're lying on the couch and you're talking about what's going on in you. That's just bizarre. Yeah. Um, I, I wish it for everyone. And at the same time, it's not easy. They say uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. And I can also say that the examined life is is no walk in the garden <laughs> either. You know. True. True. <laughs> but anyway, um, training one's intuition to deal with these questions Um not simply assume in your moment that you are you are reading the situation correctly, that you are suddenly the objective standard um, to recognize and qualify what you say. So if I think that someone's being defensive, I don't get to say you being defensive. I have to say, I, I, I bet you're being defensive. I have to clarify that I know it's just mm -hmm. a guess. Anyway, there's a lot in there, but. <laughs> no, no, it's true. It's true. And, and it, it, you actually beautifully point to the dilemma there, to the, to the fact that this actually a very complex thing. You can't just black and white say, eh, he's an asshole. No, nah, he's not. Um, equally, there's probably not one reaction to the behavior of others that is either right or wrong. But I think it is normal, just as much as there are maybe stages of grief, however much they're debated if they're there or not. There are no. stages for which you go um, after trauma has occurred. And equally, uh, if you bring that down to a small, to a kind of micro level, and uh, someone wraps you up the wrong way, there's equally there are stages for that. There will be a really, what did he just say? The, the, the disbelief, the denial, and then the, ah, let me rip his yeah. head off. So there's the anger, and then, but, and then there are other things. So that actually is normal. So I think the skill for all of us is to just take a deep breath, to actually stop for a moment before you respond. It is not a uh, medical hammer that taps your tendon and you immediately have to flick your foot forward. Um, I think the key to really surviving in toxic relationships uh, at work or difficult relationships in, the, in, in working and living with people that you would consider assholes um, is really is the mindfulness and, and is the is the uh, uh, the serenity prayer. I love that you brought that up because it's so true, isn't it? So, what do you teach people when they when they come first to you? When what? How do you try to put a mirror in front of their face to to allow them to see what is actually happening in themselves? Well, so I'm not in clinical practice. And in fact, my PhD is in decision theory. But but what does let's one make it, do? Let's make it a friend. Let's make it a friend. I got it. With I all got your it. insight, okay. with all your insight, yes. how would you, so, what is your, your how do you go yeah, about I, it? Yeah. I I, so um, I, think, I think you're onto a, a, a crucial and practical question, which is when you're dealing with someone who you suspect is um, uh, being abusive in an asshole way, How do you interact with them? And I want to say that one of my serenity prayers has to deal with this because I've had to have a lot of practice. I've had to go out and do a lot of practice of interacting with people who are, you could say, proudly or kind of obviously assholes. And also, I write a lot of articles and get a lot of comments back. And I have 
engaged in, in interaction. So um, there's nothing worse than distrusting someone trustworthy ex- other than trusting someone who's not trustworthy. There's a tough judgment call right there too. Um, so uh, if you're dealing with someone, so I think of assholes often, let's say trolls, as exhibitionists. They sidle up as if they want a real conversation and as soon as they have your attention, they open their trench coat and show off their stiff little self, heroic self-certainty. And the reason they do it is that they have a formula for calling you the loser no matter how you respond. So if you walk away, you're a wimp. If you attack them, you're unfair. You know, whatever. They've got a, they've got a response to all of those things, which makes it challenging when you're dealing with people who are responding to things that you say. I, 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 let's say a, a comment on an article I've written. Is the person just an exhibitionist or is there, are they here for a conversation? Especially if they start out kind of brash, right. you know, if they, they, they come in and they, they tell you uh, you're completely wrong and you know, they're, they're talking like they're the authority on everything. Um, there will be mistakes. There are times, there have been plenty of times when I have thought I was dealing with an asshole who actually just didn't articulate very, uh, very well or didn't, you know, whatever. Um, and so I ended up responding too snippily to someone who was actually nice. And there's <laughs> certainly been the opposite, which is I've engaged in conversation with someone who turns out to just be ex- an exhibitionist like this. So you got to recognize that this is guesswork too. Mm. But if you do feel, and I, in my book, my new book, and it's also available as a free podcast, What's Up With Assholes, um, uh, it, it, um, I point out that there will be these errors, but what I, I also give a, a, some asshole tells that is ways to, to guess better that you're mm. dealing with an asshole. Now, how do you deal with them? This is the interesting challenge. Just one I second. Think, just just one ahead, second. Please, because please. you said the tells. Let's summarize the tells. Oh, let's let's go into that. Because how do you recognize? Because the humorous question that you're saying, is it you, is it me, or is it us? Well, in order to say so, you, we look at ourselves in, in California. The same here. Oh, no, no, no. It, it must be me. The very first thing that we sort of modern enlightened men uh, yeah, now get Yeah, which is, get which is not true. It's not, it's exactly. Not, sometimes... Sometimes you're dealing with the beast and you actually, and sometimes you, you can actually afford to breathe. In some situations, you have to snap quick. Mm-hmm. So the, the, this is another reason to be training the gut. But what are the tells is a really interesting question. Um, uh, I would say it, it's, a, it's a complicated question and none of my tells are perfect. But, but one of them would certainly be if they... Um, If they have a, if they consistently will say or do anything to feel heroic, to feel triumphant, to feel, uh, um, whether they feel it or not, whether they, whether they will say anything from a short list of boilerplate Mm. dismissals um, that make it so they're not just, they don't just get to control the interpretation they play judge over which interpretation is better. So if you enter a debate with them, they don't debate you. They will play judge presiding over the debate, what I call trump hiring. And now I'm not named after Donald Trump, but it's you're playing, you're pretending you're the umpire mm-hmm. with trump cards. It's not just um, uh, my interpretation wins, but I am the judge of which interpretation wins um, and mine does. Huh. So that would be one kind of tell. There are others I list as well, but if you feel like you're dealing with someone who is consistently doing that with you, then you have, then I'm suggesting that you move on to two, two often overlooked um, uh, practices or responses to them that I think make a big difference. And, and I'm just surprised and disappointed by how little they're exploited because they're, they're kind of obvious. The ways to respond to an asshole uh-huh. if you've bet that you're de- dealing with one. So the, the, first one, um, the first one is based on a concept I call gum babying. It was called tar babying, but that's now considered a racial epithet. And the original African term was gum baby. So what a gum baby would be where you accuse someone of something such that no matter how they respond, the accusation sticks. Uh, so for example, you're being defensive, no matter how you respond to that, or it's not all about you, um, 
or you're boring. These are things that are very difficult to respond to without, in a way, affirming it. Now, I think that they're unconscionable to use with normal people. But if you're dealing with an asshole, this is what I'm suggesting, especially if there's an audience. This guy will say or do anything to feel heroic. That is their one trick phonies. That's all they've got. Their whole conscience and, and capacity to think has atrophied because this trick has tool that has worked so well for them. So if you accuse them of that, and there, there he goes again. He'll say or do anything to pretend he's right, righteous, and mighty. Um, whatever they say in response will confirm it. That is, it'll affirm it. That is, they will give you an example in response that you can say, there he goes again. And you do it tenaciously and relentlessly, and you do not take the bait with them. They don't care about any of the points they're making. They're playing, it's three-dimensional chess, but they're playing on a completely different level from the rest of us. We're playing, we're trying to get, we're trying to figure out what's right. They're just trying to claim power um, moment to moment. So, so to, to, to address them on the content of what they're saying, totally wrong mistake. It's like it's as enabling and as asking a, psych, a psychopath if they really mean what they said. It's totally enabling. But if you simply say, this guy, look at, look at his formula. He's got this one trick. And this formula, it's all he does. He does it over and over. And he'll say, no, I don't. That's what you do. See, he did it again. He did it again. Uh, 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 and you just do it relentlessly. You will not win with them. They'll call you all sorts of names and they'll leave the room in disgust. That's the closest you get with assholes. And you've made it cost them <laughs> as much as you can. So that's one trick that I employ. And I also have to be very clear. Um, this is something you can employ in certain circumstances. In others, your obligations, your life, your, your, your job is on the line. Don't try this at home. This stuff is, this is a real problem. I still think we need to know in our repertoire what the tools are, even if you can't use them in your surgical practice. Mm -hmm. You still need to know what they are in case you get an opening because the guy needs to be stopped. It's our mm -hmm. civic duty to thwart assholery. We have to do it. We have to, we have to, we have to keep people from playing God in public. Do it offline. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. You're so right. But then again, uh, ultimately, you need to make that call for yourself. You need to be very clear to yourself. What are the consequences if you call someone out? No, that's um, right. No, it's just, and yeah. that it is. Uh, it is. It's the problem of whistleblowing to a certain degree. Sure, uh, of if course. If you wanted to to go through more formal channels, uh, etc., it is. It very rarely ends up well. Um, it's yeah. uh, certainly not for the whistleblower. It's great that things come out into the open, but the moment you do that, you make yourself arch enemies. Um, and these enemies can fight very, very dirty. Um, we've just seen that in the last 24 hours where our national party here in, in New Zealand, yeah. uh, they axed um, a, um, an MP because the MP was rightly or wrongly, trying to, to establish a coup um, and, and take over the leadership uh, yeah, of the party. That. That was... And then they duck something out, a, a comment he made at, at a, a drunken party yeah. five years ago that had all been dealt with, but that came out. And because of that, we're going to sack you to prevent you uh, yeah. actually attacking the, 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 the head of the yeah. party. So we, so we, yeah, we, this, is a, this is a major problem. We're in a kind of a lockup here. I think and we, there's a lot of people who wring their hands about the political correctness on the left. I just think that whenever you get assholes want to engage in an in infallibility blood match, which is um, winner takes all, loser pays all. Either I'm right about everything and you're wrong about everything or vice versa. It's a match to the death about infallibility. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of thing that people can stumble into. For example, if I said, Wow, you think the white, the Beatles' White Album came out in '72? You don't know anything, do you? That's the, that can trigger you into an infallibility battle. But there are also people who will simply play it. Assholes will tend to play it. Every mark against you proves that they're right about everything and you're wrong about everything. And once you get that going, there will be an epidemic of it. On um, uh, 
there will be cults and counter cults. Mm -hmm. So the left and the right are now doing it here. It's dumbing us down because no, nobody's right about everything. We are all fallible. We're just trying to guess what's right. And mm -hmm. you, and if you're, if you're dealing with people who won't play that game and are simply playing on this other chess dimension mm -hmm. where they, they're right about everything. And that's the whole goal mm -hmm. of the game. No, it's, um, it's a real problem. I, I happened to spend two hours on the phone the other day with America's most famous whistleblower. I don't um so and and he actually lucked out. He was he uh Dan Ellsberg, the guy who uh, did the Pentagon papers. He's now 90 years old. He's been a good friend for years. He was a, a founder in the field of behavioral economics. Um and uh, but he was one of the rare lucky ones who actually uh got off. I remember in about 1993, we were having breakfast one day and he says i um yeah, the pentagon papers happens in what 72 or something he says this is a year i would have gotten out of jail um if uh if i had if i had been um if i'd been sentenced but he Absolutely. the case was thrown out so anyway he was most whistleblowers don't don't do as well as he did <laughs> i was about to say so yes uh god grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I'm I'm guilty as charged. I have been Don Quixote fighting windmills because I was trying to do everything there for, uh, yeah, I was fighting battles in my life that I could have never won and, uh, and I paid the price for it and with hindsight it's stupidity. But again, there is also there are there are reasons why we do why we respond to that, and I think yeah. that is the that is the important bit for all of us. We need to recognize what is going on. We need to learn about the emotions that that are triggered there. So many of us are are blind in that regard. They just there is something coming and it bam things come out of your mouth and you think whoa what's that and uh, it is the first step is I think is recognizing okay this is anger how does it feel like how does it ah okay that oh yes er ah oh, I feel that in my stomach so really recognizing what it actually is labeling it and getting to know your emotion. I think that sure. is the, the, the key thing. And in, in, in rehab, we had we had every day, 10 o'clock, we sit around in a circle and no sunglasses, no hat, no nothing in your hands. And silence, because you're talking about emotions. It was the hardest and the most hated, hated uh, setting that you could imagine on the day, because we, we addicts are terrible in, in dealing with our emotions. So therefore, if quite rightly so, this was there for a reason. So that is, I think, step one, recognize what emotion is actually coming up there. And then the question, the next question should really be, why is that? Why do you get triggered that way? And, um, I think that is really sort of the sequence of events. But in order to do both of these things, you have to stop for a moment. The worst thing you can do is to respond to an asshole there and then. And I still fall foul to that every day I drive in a car. I'm a hothead when it comes to people just uh, doing stupid things in front of me. I'm the worst. I'm the worst. And from now on, then I press on the on the horn. And yeah, guess what? Amongst our sixty thousand or so people living here, there are about thousand gang members and associates. So sometimes I have some interesting, beautiful discussions with others uh, that I maybe did not intend to have in that moment in time. Um, so yeah, there are there are. There are so many steps. So sometimes, these guys, uh, we've talked a lot about assholes here today, but I think that the key thing is, regardless of what happens to you in your life, take a moment, take that second, take that breath, a deep breath in, hold it, deep breath out, and then see if you still want to respond that way. Now, it might very well be that the guy deserves that. And that's okay. Go out, go nuts. Um, but yeah, live, uh, live with the consequences, yeah. I guess, it's, yeah, I um, uh, I I guess I am noticing this. Um, uh, take a moment and then decide how to respond. I'm actually suggesting that we need to add two things to our repertoire, and I only name the one, the gum babying thing. Um, uh, there's another one that I think is really important. If we don't have it in our repertoire, if our repertoire is limited, then a pause will still leave us with our limited repertoire. And I want to suggest there is another opportunity okay. in there. And um, and so I'll just mention this one. Um, I mentioned that I'm a 
fallibilist, which means that I know that I'm just guessing what to do. Um, I have gotten more peace of mind from that than any formula for how to live right that I've tried to aspire to. That's to recognize that I'm guessing, that I'm learning, and that, uh, but I, but to be very clear on the dimensions on which I'm learning. For example, when to have serenity and when to have courage. They both sound positive, but obviously there are times for one and times for the other, or else you wouldn't need the wisdom to know the difference. So I'm not looking for a formula. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually looking to, to, to ride the windy roads of life skillfully. Sometimes I want to be more serene, sometimes more uh, courageous. I don't want to fall off the road in either direction. Um, mm. That's fallibilism. And what I have found very useful with assholes or anybody like that is to flaunt fierce fallibilism. So by, remember, my point was no matter how confident I am in a bet, I can be really assertive about a bet, but I never want to be more assertive about a bet, so assertive about a bet that I, that I consider it a certainty. So, um, so I'm, so when I'm dealing with an asshole, a, a very standard move that they'll make is they'll pull out one of the virtue or vice words and accuse you of the vice word. So you're a name caller. Don't be a name caller. Well, yeah, there's an irony right there, which is that name caller is a name. Don't be negative. That's actually a negative assertion. Don't be judgmental is a judgmental is a judgment. <laughs> So, so I, I look at those things. That doesn't make me dismiss them. Ha ha, you're being hypocritical when you say don't be judgmental because you just said you shouldn't be judgmental. That's a judgment. No, I recognize that when to be judgmental, uh, how and when to be judgmental and not be judgmental yeah. is part of the winding road I'm on in my life. So if they accuse me of that, the natural response would be to defend myself against whatever supposed vice word there is. Yeah. And I'm saying... No, I don't want to just be a name caller. I want to be a name caller with surgical precision. I'm, I'm, I want a name call right, not wrong. Mm. I want to be, a, I want to be judgmental, right, not wrong. I'm trying to figure. I need the wisdom to. I'm looking for, like you. I'm looking for the wisdom to know the difference between when to do which of opposite behaviors. Mm. And the difference between us is that you pretend that you don't live that way. You pretend that you are never judgmental while being judgmental. You're, you, you know, whether you're a fundamentalist hypocrite or whether you're a cynical hypocrite doesn't matter to me. The fact is you're pretending to police the world. You're blaring your police siren at everybody else so loud that you don't have to hear your own errors, your own, your own driving on the winding road of life. So, so this is where I've gotten my most peace of mind, which is. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out when to be, you know, when to be which of opposite yeah. things. Yeah. And when I make a mistake, I correct it. I say, yeah. oh, I mean, that is, I adjust my gut. I try to learn. To, so I'm suggesting that beyond the pause, the pause is useful. But, the, but you should add these two things to your repertoire, especially if you're dealing with jerks. And one of them is to really flaunt your humanness. Your humanness is that you are a creature driving yeah. an uncertain, windy road that changes as you drive it. And it's, it's changing. And anybody who tells you always steer to the right or always to the left, they're missing yeah. the point. It's a windy road. <laughs> so true. Very, very true. And this can be in an incredible, powerful um, move. If someone labels you as something and yeah. you actually say, yeah, you're right. Um uh, No, I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do that in the right way. It's not, the move itself is not a virtue or a vice. It all depends on on the context. I'm trying to figure out whether in this particular situation, name calling is appropriate. Or <laughs> it is no. It is good. It just there is there is a skill to de-escalating someone to take their yeah. arguments away. And if you see a master at work. It is most beautiful. There are some very good bullying workshops yeah. out there where um, where uh, teenagers are being brought up to the stage and say, come on, hurt me. Try to really hurt me. And you're fat, you're ugly, you stink, these kind of things. And then the, there is the way, oh, no, I'm not. What, what do you mean? And defensive, etc. And the, the yeah. bully wins any time. Right. So we're so, that's what we're talking about here. Exactly. Yeah. And on the flip side, oh, if you actually say, that's right. If you actually say, I stink, oh, thank you for pointing that out. I better put some, some uh, deodorant on. That's, uh, thank you for telling me. Um, 
uh, okay, okay, you're ugly. And yeah, okay, but, yeah, that's okay. But you know, I've got a great heart, etc. You, you do that, and, oh, oh, you completely rip the, the rug from underneath someone, and that's a beautiful skill. So rather than respond with yeah. your anger, which I would have done, which would be my my trademark, um, I nowadays <laughs> I tried nowadays to to play a different game. And it and, is a game, I'm, ultimately, isn't it? It is. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm suggesting one step beyond owning it, which is owning your... So if someone says you're a wimp, let me see how to, do, how to make this clear. Um, it's not, I can imagine bullies who could stay relentless even as you kept on owning every insult they put at you. What I'm trying to say is, how can you turn the tables? What I'm trying to say is that there are, um, uh, that the ir ironic approach where you say, yeah, I mean, remember Winston Churchill about, um, or I, it, there, there, there is a quote like that from Churchill, but there's also, um, uh, I'm fat, but you're ugly and I can lose weight. I mean, there are, there are ways to make sure that they know that they're, hu that you see them as human too, yep. um, uh, and they have to do with the fact that every human being is a combination of gifts and flaws, and they're all trying to guess what to do. And anybody who pretends that they have found the formula for victory um, is laughable because exactly. that's just not how life, how reality works. Um, and so it is especially tr useful with moral, the moral cudgels, the the, the things like you're being judgmental. Yeah, I'm being judgmental. I'm trying to figure out when to be judgmental, how to be judgmental. Uh, and I'm not someone who pretends that they never judge while judging. Mm. I think that's an interesting extra flourish that I think can, can, can help. And there are situations in which I th think we need to be really fierce. We got to make it cost these people. And sometimes being soft with them, um, I want to be fierce yeah. in ways that don't attack their person. And don't attack their content because they don't care about their content, but attack their MO. It's a yeah. robotic habit they've gotten into where they'll say or do anything to be pretend they're heroic. So. Uh, very good. Very, very true. See, there is, I mean, assholes are complex. Dealing with them is even more complex. Um, and, and yeah, there is, there is no, never a clear-cut answer. But I'm very, very grateful for you to come onto my show today because ultimately you actually made me think of it and you encouraged me to actually look at it broader, look at it not just is it me or is it them um, or us. I like the you muse. Uh, actually, Good. that is that is a new thing in my repertoire now. Um, but I, to actually look at the whole thing broader. So... As with every good interview, I go away thinking, and I hope you guys out there are the same, because we've we've touched upon many, many, many aspects and facets of this really complex complex issue. Because humans are complex, and and things are changing. Things are changing. I, uh, you know, oh for Christ's sake, I was an asshole for a certain period of time. Um, I know many of my colleagues that I call friends and good colleagues. They've gone through hard times where they were real assholes in defense of their, their them being stressed and distressed. Um, so it is, there's so many aspects and so many nuances there. But uh, hopefully we, 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 we brought a bit of, of light into the chaos. There. We, we showed you a few of the, the, uh, the thoughts that can run through your mind and sh the, the things you should maybe consider um, next time you are triggered and you're facing a situation where you clearly are feeling emotions you don't like in response to a person yeah. who is, is around you. And so hopefully that our, the insights that you gain from our interview will arm you with, uh, with a better way forward. And there is no right answer. I love the winding road uh, analogy because that is exactly it. It's your call um, to, to make. No one can take that away from you. Because also, whatever call you make, there are consequences to that. It's that there's always the butterfly effect there. Um, but hopefully, you you guys out there have have.
gained a better understanding of assholes and and maybe of you yourself, because <laughs> after all, we all are assholes a bit ourselves as well. Jeremy Sherman, a fantastic guest, uh, a man with a very sharp tongue, a sharp wit, um, and a uh, and. 25 years of experience in looking into himself and others. Your book, I know you're just wanting to change the title, uh, but just tell us the title again. Yeah, and the, so the, book is, yeah. The, the book is called What's Up With A-Holes? Uh, how, to stop, how to Spot and Stop Them Without Becoming One. Uh -huh. I, 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 I want to clarify one quick thing. Um, I can never rule out the possibility that I'm an asshole. That is, that's fundamental to this work. Um, I also don't think assholes are complicated. They make things complicated. Uh -huh. uh, people often make life a whole, louder, hard, a whole lot harder than it has to be mm -hmm. by pretending it's a whole lot simpler than it can be. So uh, I actually think that they are quite simple. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the problems. They oversimplify. They, it, they're, they're not fit for reality, which is a winding road and therefore complicated. <laughs> Yeah, not fit for reality. Oh, not my goodness. For, right, That's right. And, what and, a beautiful and, saying. I think you've just described half of the politicians around the world. Um, but just, uh, let's not go there. Let's not go there. That's no, a whole no. – That's. I, I think we need to do a follow-on uh, interview here in, and uh, explore more about the assholes. I think there's every six months there will be a new set of assholes trying to rule the world. And so I yeah, think – Yeah, and that, <laughs> that's also built into the, the circumstances that I think it would be very hard to be a politician and not be an asshole. And I don't want to be an asshole consumer who's just like disappointed that, uh, that politicians are the way they are. Mm. It's built into the system, but that's another whole conversation. <laughs> and, and, and no, I, I, I'm not cutting them slack by saying that. Mm. Uh, it's uh, questions of degree matter to me a lot. We all have asshole inclinations. Um, that doesn't mean that we're all equally uh, assholes. You know, there's nothing human that's foreign to me. Mm. I know what it's like to feel like Stalin. I actually have had experience that. I was teaching a, a hundred student class in psychology and there was one student who was kind of uppity and I wanted to suppress him. And I said, oh, now I get it. But there's questions of degree. Mm. I would not have gone as far as Stalin did. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> Oh, I, I, I hope that goes with. I hope that goes without saying. <laughs> Absolutely, Jeremy, you were a fantastic guy. So thank, thank you so much you. for for sharing your insights. I truly, truly appreciated it. And you guys out there, you look after yourself. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>